Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. My name is Eric Peterson. I am the director of the Pelican Center for Technology and Innovation. It has been uh, quite some time since I've seen all of you. Um, I hope you're all doing well and uh, surviving the snowstorm that we have throughout most of the southern United States. Um, today we have a really interesting topic today. We're going to be talking about uh, telehealth, not only in Louisiana, uh, but in some of our uh, neighboring southern states as well. Um, before we get started, though, I want to encourage you to uh, like this post, uh, share it, and most importantly, uh, we, know we really want this to be a conversation with all of you, so please uh, type in your questions and I will make sure to get to all of them, uh, whether about telehealth or you know, anything we're talking about today. Um, so without any further ado, we have two great guests. Um, we have uh, Vittorio from the Reason Foundation and we have uh, Russ Latino from um, our neighboring state of Empower Mississippi. How are you guys doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Doing great. So uh, first off, Russ, I got to start with you. Um, you're a little bit uh, farther north of me than I am in uh, New Orleans. How are you doing with the weather up there? Yeah, it's been interesting. You know, uh, Mississippi uh, does not normally get three to five inches of ice uh, that lasts for a solid week. Uh, so we've been kind of iced in, but it's been a, a great reprieve uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and we've got, you know, we've got two kids, Eric, so they've had a blast with uh, with sledding and, and kind of enjoying the snow. So um, I'm ready for it to go away now. It's time for it to melt, but on net, it's uh, it's been good. Well, I'm glad your, uh, your kids have been enjoying it, but um, I, I think that's actually a great place to start because so many people are snowed in right now uh, across the Southern United States. Um, and of course, just because you're snowed in doesn't mean you necessarily uh, can't go see your doctor or you need to see your doctor. And one of the ways that we can do that today uh, is through telehealth. And Vittorio, you've been working with us at the Pelican Institute on a great paper on telehealth in the state of Louisiana. So let's just start off with the basics. You know, what is telehealth? Oh, you know, we've heard a lot about it. We know that its usage is going up, but what is it exactly? Yeah, the terms telehealth and telemedicine broadly refer to the use of telecommunications or digital communications technology uh, for the delivery of healthcare services or information, uh, which is a long way of saying uh, it's using telecommunications or, uh, to connect patients to doctors remotely. So you don't have to be in the same room and you can even be doing it across state lines. Awesome. So there's actually kind of a few different ways to do um, telehealth. Can you kind of just break those down? Because I, I think when most people think telehealth, they think of what we're doing right here, right? We're, we're on some kind of Zoom or Skype and talking to our doctor, but that's not the only way you can de uh, deliver telehealth. Right. So that's certainly one way that's uh, usually referred to as synchronous audio video uh, telehealth. And uh, most states permit that sort of communication, but we also have asynchronous technologies uh, or store and forward, which uh, is, is not happening live. Uh, patients can upload things like images or pre-recorded videos. So um, maybe some MRIs or even video of a, a visit with another doctor uh, so that a remote doctor can review that later. Um, so it doesn't be ha have to be happening at the same time. Uh, and then finally, there's remote patient monitoring which refers to the transmission of health data, um, which can include things like your vitals, your heartbeat, uh, as well as your, your weight uh, and, and other sort of uh, common health metrics. Uh, and that's sort of helpful for uh, monitoring patients after they've been uh, discharged from a health facility. And it can often be done with things like wearable tech or uh, home uh, technology. Uh, from patient. Yeah, the, uh, the, the at patient monitoring has been proven to be really important. There's a lot of costs that you can run up when you're home. Stuff like the Apple Watch has made that kind of more accessible um, than, than ever before. Um, before I go over to Russ, Vittorio, just um, you, you've gone really quickly through our laws in Louisiana. Just broadly, what do they look like? Are, are all three of those um, kinds of technology available for the patients and doctors in Louisiana? Um, so Louisiana's telehealth laws uh, get a little bit complicated because the state makes a distinction between the two terms telemedicine and telehealth and not all of the state statutes uh, use both terms and so telehealth in louisiana refers to uh, non-physician healthcare providers while telemedicine refers to just physicians uh, so uh, non-physician providers like nurse practitioners 
are able to do things like asynchronous uh, telehealth and live video conferencing and remote patient monitoring. Uh, physicians can do all of those except for asynchronous store and forward. Uh, that's not included in the state's definition of telemedicine. And then, of course, there are complications with the way that sure. uh, the state's Medicaid uh, reimburses uh, primarily just uh, live video communications. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll get. To, yeah. I'm sure we'll get into a few more details about that a little later. But we kind of got the basics there. Uh, you know, Russ, you guys in, in Mississippi, uh, up at Empower Mississippi, are doing a lot of great work. Um, on a lot of issues, they've had some great work on occupational licensing reform that we've talked on on previous telecasts. But one of the most important things that I think you all are working upon is uh, patient access to doctors. So just kind of briefly give me an overview. You know, what is Mississippi looking like in, in terms of access to physicians or nurse practitioners or other qualified uh, medical healthcare professionals? Yeah, so and, and for us, it's it's not just patient access to doctors, but but looking at patient access to, to health care. Uh, and thinking about it more holistically, which is really candidly the distinction between telehealth and telemedicine too, right? You're, you're thinking about telemedicine as something that is, I've got a cough and I need to see a physician to figure out whether or not an antibiotic is appropriate. Uh, but telehealth being something more expansive, like Victoria described, where uh, you might have access to a nurse practitioner for monitoring of diabetes, which is a big problem in the state of Mississippi, mm -hmm. the state of Louisiana. Uh, you know, I think, I think we... Mississippi and Louisiana have so much in common, and this is one of the things that we have in common, is that there's just a tremendous shortage of physicians. There's a tremendous shortage of people who are providing health care. And so in the state of Mississippi, we're actually slightly worse off than Louisiana. We've got the worst uh, primary care access shortage in the entire country. projection right now is that we'll be the only F-rated state when it comes to access to primary care wow. in the year 2030. Uh, and that's a shortage of roughly 3,700 physicians. Um, and so recognizing that the outcome of that lack of access is the, the shortest life expectancy in the country. Uh, Mississippians die four and a half years earlier than the national average. Um, and if you look at things like our health rankings, we have some of the worst outcomes in the country. We have some of the highest instances of chronic conditions in the country. And a lot of that is a byproduct of not having access to care. Now, that's not the only thing. There are, there are a multitude of other environmental factors uh, that lead to those poor outcomes, um, but certainly a, a driving factor. And so for us, what we're trying to figure out is what is the right balance to fill that gap? How do we provide access to health care, quality health care at a, a price that people can actually afford? And we're looking at a couple of different things. I mean, telehealth is certainly one of the things that we're working on. Uh, this year, we've worked very hard around um, expanding to full practice authority for nurse practitioners and optometrists uh, and have seen some early success in getting a bill to do that uh, through the House of Representatives or two bills uh, for optometry and nurse practitioners through the House of Representatives and are working in the Senate. Uh, we think it's a component piece of solving the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know you hit on some of the numbers that you guys are looking at in Mississippi. Um, and the paper of Vittorio and I are working on, I believe there are nine parishes with less than five or five or fewer um, doctors in it, which is obviously we have 64 in Louisiana. Um, so we, we face a lot of the same problems. Uh, Vittorio, I want to go back to you. Uh, what, what have the telehealth numbers looked at? I mean, telehealth has gotten um, kind of increased attention because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, a lot of people, especially people with comorbidities, have been afraid of going into the doctor's office for good reason, especially if it's kind of just a checkup and might be very dangerous for them to be around other people. Um, what what has been the, the numbers for people uh, not going to see their doctors in person and instead utilizing telehealth? Um, so in Louisiana, uh, in-person outpatient visits fell by about 22.6%. Uh, between May and June of 2020. And over that same period, telehealth visits accounted for uh, about 16% of uh, outpatient visits. Um, so while total visits tended to decline over time, telehealth was able to make up uh, some, some of that shortage. Uh, and you know that, that's sort of the demonstrated value of telehealth in times of crisis, uh, like the pandemic and now uh, in, in the snowstorms in the Southern states. 
Yeah, it, it seems that uh, while it didn't make up the whole gap, it, it made up a significant part of it. Um, Russ, when you think about telehealth as being part of that mix, um, were there any executive orders in Mississippi that expanded telehealth? You know, what, what is the way that you think about telehealth as a future of getting into that mix? And really, more importantly, um, increasing the access and the quality of health care for Mississippians. Yeah, so there, there was a loosening of some of the regulations around telehealth in Mississippi um, to allow for certain kinds of care that previously hadn't been allowed for. Um, you know, for instance, psychiatry. Um, certainly there were, were federal um, changes that, that made it easier for uh, Medicare and Medicaid populations. I think long term, uh, Mississippi's got a lot of work that it can do uh, to improve its telehealth system. Uh, to make sure that the framework is one that allows for innovation. You know, I think about as an example, payment parity. Um, and so under Mississippi law, there's a requirement of payment parity uh, for people who are doing telehealth con consults. And all that really means is that they've got to pay essentially the same thing that you would pay for, or the insurer has to pay essentially the same thing that they would pay for an in-person consultation. Well, that effectively guts a lot of the, the associated benefit with the technology itself. I mean, one of the advantages of the technology is not just the increase in supply, but it's the increase of supply at a price that is more affordable. And so if you're doing things that, that prevent the affordability from being realized by patients, uh, you're having a negative impact on access, even if the supply has been freed up. Um, and so you know, I think things like that are top of mind. I think for a long time, Mississippi has had sort of this tug of war when it comes to our regulatory framework on whether or not to allow things like um, audio consults mm -hmm. uh, versus like video only consults. Um, and, and look, I, I will tell you that there have been some positive strides, even in the legislature, they're, they're not alive right now, um, to change definitions in a way that would allow for, for more options uh, through telehealth to be available uh, to, to patients. Um, but we've got a long way to go. I mean, it, even, even in those areas where I think we're doing well, it is, a, it is a constant battle to prevent us from going back to the status quo. Um, and so there, there are constantly people who push for the idea, as an example, that, um, that you know, prescriptions shouldn't be written through telehealth consults, that it it's fine if you're going to do a telehealth consult, but not for purposes of obtaining a prescription um, or that you can't do a telehealth consult until you've had an in-person consultation um, with that physician. And so it, it effectively, um, again, restricts supply and eliminates the ability of people to access uh, that technology in a way that is convenient to them in a way that ultimately serves them the best. Um, and so I think you know, we've made positive strides, but long term, there's a lot more that we can do in the state of Mississippi. Yeah, Vittorio, um, there's a lot done in executive orders as well. Most of it was um, easing ways in which out of state uh, medical practitioners could provide telehealth services for, for people um, within the state of Louisiana. Can you kind of break those down for the audience and explain, you know, what, what changed and, you know, what were the effects of it? Did, you know, doctors in Illinois or New York or California, did they, uh, open up their services to the people of Louisiana. Yeah, so Louisiana did a couple of, of uh, emergency actions, uh, some related to coverage through Medicaid or private insurance of telehealth, um, but maybe most significantly is allowing out-of-state practitioners to provide telehealth services in Louisiana. Uh, now for non-physician providers, the executive order uh, allowed them to provide care in health facilities, and it's somewhat unclear whether or not that actually allows for telehealth visits. Um, there's not a ton of clarity in, in the uh, declaration, but for uh, physicians, it explicitly does allow uh, telemedicine. And in fact, the um, State Board of Medical Examiners is issuing temporary telemedicine permits to out-of-state physicians. And the last time that I checked, there were about 2,209 of those emergency permits issued uh, as of about a week ago. So it's, you've seen a pretty dramatic increase in the number because normally uh, the state does allow out-of-state telemedicine permits, um, mm -hmm. but usually those numbers were hovering around 70 to 100 for the last couple of years. Um, and so in 2020, there was just an, a massive increase. 
So, so Russ, I mean, I know, I know you're not from Louisiana, but you know, what, what strikes you about that number? Is it that, um, that physicians across the country just needed to know that there was more demand in places like Louisiana that was really struggling? Or is it the fact that, um, you know, these kind of executive orders were out there and some of those regulations and rules were relaxed where people might have wanted to provide services in, in places that were struggling, but um, felt that the, the red tape was just too high? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I, I think the latter is is correct, that there are plenty of people out there who are positioned to provide quality care uh, to people in states that are underserved. Uh, and effectively, they're being they're being walled out. Um, and so when you see these walls come down and you see this influx of supply and you see this influx of people who are willing to meet the needs of the people in the state of Louisiana, that, that's just proof that we've been doing it the wrong way. Um, and and I, will, I will just add, Eric, that technically I am from the state of Louisiana. I was that's, that's true. So, uh, that's as you know, I'm a Tulane grad. So, uh, but no, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting to see what can happen. Uh, it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic for it to happen. And I think the, you know, the, the next battleground is how do we make some of the changes that get put into place by virtue of COVID permanent changes because they're working? Um, and, and how do we start to recognize that somebody who's trained as a physician in Austin, Texas, is as capable at, of seeing you in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, as, as another physician who's in Lafayette? Um, you know, I, I think once we once we come to grips with the fact that we can solve problems by tearing away these kinds of barriers, it becomes really hard to retreat back to what we were doing before. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, look, we're, we're doing conferences uh, over technology right now. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, I think the idea of doing this would have seemed really weird to people. I don't know that anyone would have tuned in because uh, they would expect all three of us next together having this conversation. And now we've uh, We've, we've all kind of adopted this technology. We'll see if that kind of happens with telehealth. Uh, Vittorio, just kind of nationally, you know, what's been going on here? Have other states been been having movement on telehealth? Is there something going on federally? Have, you know, folks kind of finally realized, like Russ said, that, you know, one, once we kind of took the plunge into telehealth, that this could be a really important part of our healthcare mix? Yeah, I, so, I mean, just about every state um, north of 40 had these emergency actions that loosened a lot of the rules around telehealth, as well as some of the scope of practice uh, regulations. And yeah, there's, there's a real movement uh, in a lot of states around trying to make some of those reforms permanent. Um, you know, if you're looking for a state that's really done sort of the model for what a telehealth law should look like, Florida actually provides a great example. Um, they allow out-of-state registration for doctors as well as uh, non-physician providers like nurse practitioners. Um, and, uh, you know, we have uh, recognition of the various different types of telemedicine. Uh, so that that's sort of a, a model. And that happened actually um, just before the pandemic as well as some scope of practice reform. So Florida is kind of leading the way on uh, these sort of uh, deregulatory efforts uh, in healthcare. Awesome. Yeah, Florida, Florida, um, as always, is doing a great job embracing innovation. Uh, they're doing some great stuff over there, and uh, hopefully some other states will take note. Um, I will say we got about 10 minutes left, so if you have any questions, uh, please drop them in chat now. Um, I'm sure Vittorio or Russ would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, but Russ, I want to I want to hit on one thing that Vittorio said on the scope of practice. Um, we we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but I really want you to get in the weeds here and explain how scope of practice can not only help um, you know, healthcare in general, but especially with telehealth. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take on healthcare in general and then we can speak to, to telehealth. Um, you know, there are, in all 50 states, nurse practitioners are capable of prescribing medication to patients. Uh, and a nurse practitioner, just for, for your audience, is something more than a registered nurse, right? So uh, you become a registered nurse, the average registered nurse goes about eight years before they would go for certification as a nurse practitioner. You get either a master's or a doctorate um, as a nurse practitioner that can take between two and four years to get that certification. Um, and then once you're, once you're certified as a nurse practitioner, you're able to prescribe medication in all 50 states. In 45 of the 50 states, you're able to see patients without active supervision of a physician. 
Um, so like in Mississippi, as an example, we're one of those 45 states. Um, nurse practitioners are supplying primary care at a two to one ratio over primary care physicians. Um, and in many, many settings are doing that without a physician in the office. Uh, Mississippi has a requirement uh, that a physician be within 75 miles of where that nurse practitioner uh, is operating. And so and it's actually come down, actually. So I think it may it may be slightly more than that now. But anyway, um, about half of the states have what is called full practice authority. And full practice authority just means that a nurse practitioner can do what she's already trained to do or he's already trained to do, but they don't have to enter into something called a collaborative agreement. And a collaborative agreement is essentially, like in Mississippi, as an example, uh, a nurse practitioner has to get a, a physician to enter into a contract with them. And under Mississippi law, that physician has to uh, do a review of 10% or 20 uh, of a nurse practitioner's chart, whichever is less. Um, and so if a nurse practitioner sees 500 patients in a month, then that physician has to do a review of uh, 20 charts um, or, or 50 or 20. So they take whichever is less. Um, and oftentimes that review occurs, Eric, weeks after a patient has been seen. So let's say you've got a sore throat, you go into a rapid care clinic, uh, you see a nurse practitioner, she determines that it's something that antibiotics would be uh, useful for. She prescribes you antibiotics. Um, there's a 10% chance that your file might get reviewed weeks after you've been treated. Uh, and in exchange for that collaboration, that mandatory collaboration, uh, nurse practitioners are paying on average $1,850 a month. I've talked to some that are paying upwards of $5,000 a month for this sort of retroactive review of their charts. Well, the end result of that is that you end up having fewer nurse practitioners practicing independently. Uh, it creates an economic drag. If you're spending $20,000 in overhead for a review process that covers very few charts on the back end of treatment, um, that is a disincentive for you going into business. It's also a disincentive for lenders to lend you money to go into business. So there's a capital restriction. Um, and it, a big part of that is because a physician can back out of a collaborative agreement and effectively shut down a clinic. So as an example, there was a nurse practitioner in, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi that I talked to that had operated a successful clinic for six years. Her doctor retired and backed out of the collaborative agreement. Uh, and she was left in a place where she had to close her doors until she could find another physician to, to provide this, this review process. Uh, she ended up having to pay $3,500 a month because the leverage was all on one side of the equation. And so the end result in states that don't have this collaborative agreement requirement is that you see a lot more nurse practitioners. Arizona saw a 73% increase in rural nurse practitioners after they went full practice authority. Uh, there have been studies done by the Census Bureau that show like a 20 some odd, like 29% increase uh, in the number of nurse practitioners in states that moved to full practice authority and makes sense economically. The other thing that you see is that evaluations go up. So there's an 11% uptick and the number of medical evaluations that are being done in full practice authority states. And there's a corresponding decrease in the number of emergency room visits that are happening in full practice authority states. Uh, simultaneously, Duke University has done a study that shows that there really is no decline in the quality of care, uh, that patients report satisfaction levels at or above the satisfaction levels that they had with primary care physicians. And so, the evidence is there, it's pretty clear that it increases supply if you move towards full practice authority. Not only does it increase supply, but it increases access, brings down cost, ultimately is less of a burden on the emergency room system, and, and patients report that they're satisfied with the care that they're receiving. Um, so all of that is a net benefit, but you can understand why there are some people who push back against it because it, it affects them economically. They have a pecuniary interest in the status quo. Um, you know, where this comes into play with telehealth is the stuff that Vittorio was talking about on the front end. I'll give you a quick case study. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was an, uh, an experiment essentially done in the Mississippi Delta, uh, C Spire, which is a telecommunications company, partnered with UMMC uh, to do a monitoring experiment of people who had diabetes in the Delta um, and using telehealth. And the, the results were remarkable. I, I forget the exact percentage, so I won't throw it out there, but there was a significant reduction in hospitalizations 
um, as a result of complications with diabetes amongst these patients uh, because they had this sort of monitoring service uh, and regular interaction. And the truth is that in a state with a physician shortage of 3,700 and in a state that restricts out-of-state physicians from providing uh, telehealth uh, consults, which is another thing that should change in Mississippi, um, nurse practitioners can fill that gap and have a tremendous impact, not only on quality of life for patients, but ulti ultimately uh, duration of life uh, for patients. And so in a lot of ways, these ideas, telehealth, full practice authority, um, I know we're not talking about con law today, but con law would be another one that I would throw out. All of these things are artificial restrictions on the supply of care that drive up the cost of care that make it less likely that people receive quality care that ultimately helps save their lives or gives them a better quality of life. And so they all fit together really, really well. Yeah, that, that rep uh, remote patient monitoring that Vittorio is talking about, really important on, on doing some of that managed care with diabetes. Like you said, it's a, it's a big problem in both Mississippi and uh, Louisiana. Vittorio, I want to get one other thing real quick. You talked a little bit about it. I just think they're really cool. Tell us a little bit about uh, prescription vending machines. I know it kind of sounds crazy, the idea that you're going to put medication that, that you have to get a prescription for and just something you can swipe your credit card in. How does that work? Right. So in general, uh, we're talking about non-narcotic or, or, or not controlled substances in the vending machines. Uh, there are some additional rules that might allow that sort of thing. Um, but in how this works generally for a patient is you would walk up to this kiosk and it actually allows you to interface over audio and video with a pharmacist in a remote location. So you can have one of these sort of vending machines um, in a rural area that might not have access to a pharmacy uh, and they can also operate um, ideally 24 hours a day uh, because you, you're not reliant on uh, the pharmacist being physically in at the pharmacy or at the at the point of contact with the patient um, and so you know this is like a great opportunity for expanding pharmaceutical access but states will do things like require that uh, you can't have a another pharmacy site within a certain mile radius uh, of the kiosk uh, which you know that can sort of limit the implementation of these things as well as yeah, like yeah. I said things like 24 hour access, because while there might be a pharmacy there uh, during the day, uh, if you wanted to be able to access one of these kiosks uh, in the evening after work, or if you you know got off a late shift, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. Yeah, so in, in many cases, the, uh, the, the vending machine wouldn't even be competing directly with the pharmacy because they'd be dealing with them at a different time. Uh, well, just, just an incredible innovation, something that sounds like a science fiction 20 or 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, we're already seeing implemented. Uh, so I'll give you each a, a minute to finish here. Um, I'll start with you, Russ. If, if there's one kind of change to telehealth that you would like to see in the state of Mississippi, uh, what, what would you like it to be? Um, you know, I think we talked earlier about uh, the idea of something like payment parity. Removing that, I think, is, is uh, significant. I think m making it very clear uh, that there can be multi-mode telehealth uh, so that you're not limited at certain uh, certain kinds of technology in the way that telehealth is provided, uh, really to provide for that kind of permissionless innovation uh, would be very helpful. Um, you know, look, I, I would tell you that, um, you know, necessity is the, the mother of invention. And in Mississippi, uh, and certainly in Louisiana too, you guys really aren't that different from Mississippi. Um, you know, there is, there's tremendous necessity. And the question at some point that legislators and policymakers have to ask themselves is, you know, do I want to preserve a status quo that yields uh, early death and poor quality of life for people? Or do I want to, instead of doubling down on what's not working, be able to look my, my constituents in the eye and say that I made an effort to make sure that you had access to quality care at a price that you can afford? Um, and, and my hope in Mississippi is that lawmakers are starting to realize that uh, doubling down on the status quo is a fool's errand that ultimately hurts the people that they're elected to represent. And I suspect that people in Louisiana and lawmakers in Louisiana will eventually come to that same conclusion. And so while at times I get, um, get disheartened by some of the protectionism that we see, uh, overall, the, the future belongs to people 
uh, who believe in innovation. And I think we see it happening now and we see sort of that breakup of some of these cartels and cabals in a way that is pretty encouraging. Yeah, I, I for one am very hopeful. I think you're talking about is as people take the plunge into using for telehealth kind of for the first time um, and we get more used to it, that there'll be some more demands by people to, to make it easier to use. Uh, Vittorio, you, you've done a great deep dive into our, our laws in Louisiana. Just kind of leave us with, with one kind of quick thing that you think uh, might be small, but could make some real impacts to expanding telehealth access in Louisiana. Yeah, uh, Louisiana's telehealth laws have all of the pieces that you would want to see in an ideal telehealth law. The problem is that the statute does not require licensing boards to actually follow through on all of those things. It merely gives them the option to. So for example, things like out of state registration for uh, non-physician providers to, to do telehealth in Louisiana, uh, that's a less burdensome path than getting full Louisiana licensure. Uh, and the law allows for the boards to issue those sorts of rules, but it does not require that they do so. And so very few of the boards, I think only speech pathologists and audiologists have done so. Um, and in fact, uh, really very few of the boards have even issued any rules around telehealth. And so there's a real lack of clarity as well as, you know, a lack of action on some of the things like out of state registration. But if the legislature were to just require that the boards do the things that are already there in law rather than giving them the option to, uh, Louisiana would have one of the best telehealth laws in the country. Wow, seems like a, a pretty interesting fix right there. Um, again, thank you both so much for joining us. It's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, Victoria, we're, we're really excited to, to, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more when we have that paper come out. It'll be coming out pretty soon. Um, Russ, we we're always very proud of all the great work you guys are doing in Mississippi, keeping us in Louisiana on our toes, making sure that we're moving forward in the uh, innovation space. Uh, but thank you so much, and let's uh, hope that telehealth keeps moving forward, whether it's uh, conferencing, uh, storing forward, or uh, remote patient monitoring. There's a lot of great stuff going on right now. So thank you so much for joining us. And all of you out there watching us, thank you so much. Uh, make sure to like and uh, share this great conversation. But we will uh, be talking to you again uh, very soon. So uh, stay warm, everyone.